Hello folks, my name is Louise Henderson. I'm a lecturer at Robert Gordon University and I'm here today to host an online session um, to explore the findings of a recent study that's happened um, as a joint venture between uh, Robert Gordon University and NHS Grampian. We're going to be telling you a little bit about the findings of the Nursing Through Covid study um, and I'd like to introduce the, the panel members who will be part of our recording today. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Dr Aileen Grant. She's a Senior Research Fellow at RGU. Hi, it was a pleasure to speak to you today. Good to have you here. Thanks, Aileen. Um, second, I'd like to um, introduce you to Dr June Brown, Executive Nurse Director at NHS Grampian. Welcome, June. Delighted to be here today. Thank you. Super to have you with us. Thanks, June. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Tom Power. He's Director for People and Culture at NHS Grampian. Welcome, Tom. Hi, thanks. It's great to be here. Super to have you here with us. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I, thought, I think without any further ado, I'll pass you on to Dr Aileen Grant to tell us uh, about the study, give us an overview of the uh, key findings as well. Over to you, Aileen. Thanks, Louise. Um, so I'm going to present the findings today from the Acute Nursing Through COVID study. Um, as Louise has said, it's a joint collaboration between NHSG and RGU. Um, and it was with a large research team, um, primarily researchers at RGU, but also with Dr Debbie Baldy from NHSG. So the aims of the video today is that we want to disseminate the findings from this research study um, and hopefully reach more participants than we would through face-to-face -face sessions. We also want to try and get some feedback from people. So we've set up an email address. This will be available again later in the video. We'd encourage you to email this with any comments or feedback or any suggestions. Um, and Ultimately, our aim is to try and um, feed into the actions and improvements for staff support within NHSG, but also in other health boards and to inform future research and further support strategies. So the background to the study. Um, it's known that the mental well-being of healthcare staff, the physical and mental well-being, is critical to high quality and safe healthcare. And so supporting staff well-being is really important to the safety and the sustainability of healthcare systems. And we know from previous pandemics that healthcare workers are at high risk of mental health difficulties during a viral epidemic. And uh, little is known about the experiences of staff working in Scotland during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we set out to explore the experiences of nurses working um, in the acute sector during the pandemic to find out how this has affected them personally and also their experiences um, and perceptions of workplace support services and their future career intentions. Um, we did this through an online survey which was widely disseminated across NHSG, primarily through the COVID brief but also emails um, and staff um, participated by completing the questionnaire which used validated uh, mental um, and stress wellbeing scores and was analysed in SPSS. And we all we um, purposefully sampled people um, to participate from their questionnaire responses to participate in qualitative interviews, and these were analysed thematically. So 108 people took part in the survey. 41 of these were redeployed within NHSG. 97 were found to be highly stressed. 32% thought about leaving nursing frequently or all the time in the last year. The data collection was between April and July 2021 and their mental wellbeing scores indicated that 45% of responses, respondents had probable or possible depression. 
We purposefully sampled 20 people based on their questionnaire responses. Most of these were aged between 26 and 55. Most of them were band seven. Seven were redeployed and 11 were working in a front facing COVID ward. And for everybody that took part in the qualitative studies that we found that the pandemic was a period of uncertainty and disruption, irrespective of role or where they were working. And all staff experienced new ways of working, particularly in wave one, which was a period of constantly changing processes and, and systems. Um, for those working in uh, COVID facing wards during wave one, it was a period of constant change and virulence and uncertainty of the pandemic, the disease. So and staff found this highly stressful, physically and mentally demanding and relentless. Nurses were often working in isolation and they were unsure what they should be doing in relation to new processes. They felt unprepared and inexperienced caring for COVID-19 patients and they felt unsupported by their managers. Those that were in managerial roles were highly stressed, trying to keep up to date with the constant changes uh, coming from Scottish Government and the health boards in the need to redesign the pathways and care procedures appropriately, and then to communicate these changes with staff. And both uh, senior and junior nurses reported a disconnect between managers and the experiences of those working day to day on the wards. Here are some quotes to illustrate the experiences of those that were working in non-COVID facing wards, particularly um, routine care was cancelled in wave one and participants were experiencing guilt for uh, not being more on the front line. They also felt inexperienced because they were caring for patients with which they had little experience. Um, and they were caring for their usual patients with less staff. Um, so as Isla explains, but really it wasn't okay. Like we were struggling as well, like our team had gone from underneath us. Um, everything we were doing, you know, where the work is normally divided between five or six of us, it was kind of two of us doing all the work. You weren't getting the same, I guess, time to follow things up and, you know, completely different circumstances. Two nurses being redeployed and the other two having to stay, but work completely differently. It was it was difficult. We just kind of got on with it at the time. But the more I think about it and the more I'm like, yeah, it definitely affected the team. And another one we called Ailey. Um, there was increasing anxiety amongst the staff of looking after patients that we wouldn't normally, if that makes sense. So every day going in and you don't really know what you're coming into. So the working conditions for those in COVID facing wards during wave two was a, a period still of disruption um, and uncertainty. Um, Hannah, who is a manager, uh, felt it was a bit more settled. And she said, one of the most common messages that we've heard was that, you know, it, there was no finding the flow the first time round. It was just so choppy, changing all the time. And then with the second time round, there was a bit more of a flow to it. It's like, okay, we've seen this before. We kind of know what to expect. And there was definitely a, a sense of, there was a strength in it. There definitely was. But for Rona, who um, was a nurse redeployed to a COVID facing ward, she says, when the first lockdown ease, it went back to how it had been. And at that point, I was the only one. I think there was only two of us from the redeployed staff that was still there. And it was just chaotic. You know, it was just, you know, people didn't know if we were supposed to be doing one thing and another thing. And it's like, well, am I allowed to move this patient into here? And like, we had different x-rays and things. And so it was be like the clean x-ray, the dirty x-ray and the clean CT and the dirty CT. And you know, it was just, it was, I guess the transition period was difficult. By wave three, um, staff were completely uh, burnt out, exhausted and experiencing low mood with no end in sight. There was a huge backlog of uh, non-related COVID work and 
for those in non-COVID facing roles, there was a huge increase in workload as uh, services came back up and running. And we have a quote from someone we've called Graham to explain. In the first wave, of activity was cut right back just to sort of inpatients. So a lot of the outpatients would have been cancelled and subsequently, subsequently, when we've been getting back up and running, we're doing extra or we're still are doing extra sessions at evenings and weekends and stuff. There's, I think there's something like a 5,000 backlog in ultrasound and 3,000 in CT. So still, still very much playing catch up. Staff experienced uh, moral dilemmas um, and moral stress and moral injury from what they were experiencing working through the pandemic. They experienced dilemmas between choosing whether to work on the front line um, and risk bringing COVID back home to friends and family. There was also dilemmas um, more uh, around PPE, particularly in the early stages when it was in short supply. There was a lot of media attention around PPE. So staff were choosing to uh, drink less, to go to the toilet less, to avoid wasting PPE, um, but giving themselves headaches. So there was lots of things going on. They also experienced moral distress um, from these dilemmas. Um, and that was experienced by all staff, regardless of what role they were in. For those in COVID facing roles, their distress was related to working in isolation and caring for patients for hours by themselves, isolated from support of their peers and managers. And also PPE and social distancing measures, they felt compromised their care standards and the affected communication um, and the care standards such as patient-centered care and shared decision-making. And some staff, moral distress caused some staff to bend the rules um, to ease uh, their uh, emotional distress. And here's an example. Um, it just made me question my whole ethos as a nurse. I've never, I've been a nurse in the health service for 30 years. This is something I've never had to do before. Stop somebody coming in to visit their dying relative. It was just awful. And some of them seemed to cope with that rule better than I did. And I, to me, I'm thinking about that relative, What's what their last thoughts of their parent was going to be, not being able to get in to see them. You know, that's something. That's what that's what stick will stick in their mind, you know. I find that really difficult. I know that there are rules, but how do you live with yourself? How do you sleep at night thinking about what you're doing? I think we got so obsessed with it in ourselves that we forgot maybe why we're nurses and why, you know, this this job, this vocation, we took on for a certain reason. It was part of our personality. And I, it's just made me question. I think, oh, this is awful. What we're doing is wrong. It's right for one reason, but actually wrong in another. Maybe that's how they just got over it by being, yes, these are the rules. We just, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. But I just really struggled mentally with how people could do it. The moral distress for those in non-COVID facing roles, they experienced um, guilt from being left behind and bereft from the loss of their redeployed colleagues. In wave one, they were demoralised from what some perceived as doing nothing. Um, and they, they felt discomfort and guilt um, but their quiet work did not match the public perceptions of how hard they were working. Um, this was at the time when there was the clapping going on and the rainbows. Um, and they also, some chose to remove themselves where they would normally work in intensive care, chose to remove themselves from, from that setting to protect themselves or family members. And they experienced a lot of guilt from not being um, on the front line um, and working in ITU. And um, others felt guilt from not being available as a, as a manager, feeling stuck behind computers. Um, dealing with constant emails and then other staff felt unprepared and inexperienced for caring for patients with conditions they had no experience. And they also were feeling useless and helpless, perceiving a decline in care standards for non-COVID patients. 
Moral injury is sort of more sustained moral distress over time and approximately a third of our sample reported mental health problems which had emerged during the pandemic. For some participants this was um, pre-existing mental health problems that had been well managed pre-pandemic but uh, the, quote, the pandemic and working through the pandemic had triggered um, these these uh, triggered these uh, problems. Um, some were able to take appropriate support, but others felt that the inflexibility of shift patterns were re-triggering these uh, stress disorders. And for some issues with alcohol consumption arose. And for those that experienced a mental health problem for the first time, they were reticent about disclosure for fear of stigma from colleagues. <laughs> The NHS uh, did provide emotional and psychological support, but for some participants, this was felt not to be easily accessible or appropriate. Um, for example, um, there was a psychologist available in a time in the communal area. Staff felt that wasn't maybe the most appropriate place to talk about it, or they were scared of starting to unearth things that they'd managed to keep a lid on and then to go back on to shift would be too difficult to talk about it at that period of time. And then also they were working really long shifts and extra hours to help the healthcare system cope. And then they didn't want to go across the site to go to the hub uh, when they just really wanted to get home, especially for those that were working right on the front line and were waiting for showers and things. So, and they also missed informal support networks. The camaraderie and humour that they were used to in supporting each other was missing. And this was particular for those in intensive care and COVID wards, where their sort of communal space had been taken up for the donning and doffing of PPE. And then also some of the social distancing measures that were put in place, of encouraging them to stay apart. Um, and then professional and social support networks um, pretty much disappeared for everybody in wave one as the whole country was in lockdown. And then it was perceived to be reduced over subsequent waves. And these are some of the examples. So senior staff being removed from clinical areas to reduce the number of people available, then working in isolation um, and a lack of flexibility in shift patterns and particularly when schools and childcare facilities were closed and some participants didn't have family members available to help. So in summary, the key conclusions of this study is that the study offers an insight into the range, into the nature and range of challenges confronted by nurses working in the acute sector. And nurses and nurse managers were exposed to a, a range of extreme working conditions. So participants reported stress, anxiety and exhaustion and had uh, also experienced moral distress and moral injury through exacerbation of existing mental health problems and sort of new problems. And these issues arose from highly stressful and demanding new working conditions and practices. Um, Psycholo as psychological and emotional troubles increased, staff experienced separation from their usual forms of support with familiar working relationships um, and embedded sort of knowledge, uh, taking comfort in, in usual routines and processes and resources. These had all gone and it was a real period of disruption. And the experiences here are not unprecedented. They actually align remarkably with the uh, the experiences of staff working in previous pandemics, H1N1, Ebola, and also uh, from COVID-19 pandemic studies in other countries, in other Western countries, England, Australia, Canada, Italy, uh, and Israel. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to say thank you for listening. And um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, June and Tom, who are going to talk about um, the organisational response from NHSG. Thank you both uh, for sharing the results of the study with us. Um, from an NHS Grampian perspective, I would like to say an enormous thank you to the nurses who contributed to the study and were very honest. And the, the findings from this study will really help us shape how we move forward and also provide evidence to other uh, organisations within Scotland um, to consider how they move forward as well. 
during this time. The findings from the, um, the research are really stark. And um, as a board, NHS Grampian were really mindful of this and wanted to ensure that the health and well-being of our staff is absolutely key and at the forefront of everything that we do. So just having a real look at the research, and, and um, we've been spending some time looking at compassionate leadership for nursing within Grampian. And Julie, really the findings align very nicely with the work that the King's Fund have done already. So if we think about um, the need for autonomy, it was quite clear from the findings that the nurses didn't feel they had that autonomy within their work life. The changing of the guidance rules all the time. It was really difficult for them to, to establish what they, they, they were supposed to be doing and they had no control over it. And that loss is really heard clearly from this study. Equally, the need to belong. They were part of teams, which was really important. And that team through redeployment changed and they were part of a new team which was a real um, struggle for them to develop new relationships and work in this very changing environment when they needed the support from the, the team that they knew and were, were part of for, for a long time. And also the need to contribute. We really heard about um, nurses who felt they weren't contributing um, to, to, the, to the ask during the pandemic because the work that they were doing was different um, from the need at that point in time to deliver our services safely and they didn't feel fully effective. So these are some of the examples that I've picked up that are really, really clear. So as a board, NHS Grampian really feel that they need to do something really effective to ensure our staff's wellbeing. I'm going to hand you over to Tom to talk quite broadly about what we've been doing since the beginning of really wave one of the pandemic. Thanks very much, June. And uh, I mean, just to reiterate, first of all, what you said in terms of thanking colleagues for taking the time to, uh, to participate in the research. I think, you know, there is certainly a familiarity to some of the themes uh, that, that, uh, that the, the, the presentation uh, highlights, but that doesn't stop them being any more sobering. And, uh, and of course, they also give greater, I guess, fidelity to, uh, to the picture and, and will support our understanding of what's maybe been most challenging for our colleagues and, and where we need to focus our attention moving forward. Um, I'd like to um, focus really on, on three areas and, and talk a little bit about, um, about what we've what we've learned, but also what we're going to be doing moving forward, because the focus on keeping staff safe and helping to maximise their well-being isn't something that we are simply you know associating with with the, the COVID pandemic response, but is actually critical to to how we want to operate and function as a new organisation moving forward, and to supporting the regeneration, I guess, of uh, of the system that we're part of and and the people that that, that are you know who who make us what we are uh, as uh, as a health and care organisation. So I'd like to touch on three things around staff deployment, around the support that managers provide, and, and also about how uh, colleagues can access support before I, I hand on to, to June. So I guess uh, temporary deployment, as the, as the research suggests, is one of the you know, uh, un unavoidable, but very challenging aspects of the last couple of years for many colleagues. And, and we've, we've, we've understood that through, uh, I guess, the, the three uh, operational periods that we've had where we've been, we've work, been working at, I guess, our most escalated level of, system, uh, of response to, to, the, to the pandemic. And where um, we've, we've taken the opportunity on each occasion to, to, to learn from and engage with staff who've been temporarily deployed to understand their experiences, what's worked for them, what's been more challenging, and how we can ensure that appropriately person-centered approach is taken to the temporary deployment of staff. We know from that that colleagues really value staying in their teams, and, and that's something we've, we've sought to be mindful of in, uh, in seeking to ask colleagues to work in areas that are less familiar to them. It's a real challenge to achieve that, but I think being aware of and mindful of the impacts on, on people's well-being of, of being asked to go and, if you like, uh, start afresh in a new area at very short notice is something that's been up front and centre of the thinking around how we do deal with temporary staff deployment. Secondly, um, I guess managers have a key role to play in that respect, both in terms of the teams that people are in and are established in, but also when colleagues are coming to an area new. And we can see from some of the, the research findings that there's maybe variable experience of, of you know, managerial support in that respect. And of course, this is a hugely pressured time and remains a hugely, hugely pressured time for, uh, for managers themselves as well. So there are a lot of challenges for them, for them to deal with. One of the things we really kind of 
putting a premium on though is, is support for managers in helping them support others' well-being. And uh, we were fortunate to have accessed some funding through the NHS Charities Together uh, Endowment that was, um, uh, I guess, uh, funded by the monies that Cap Sir Captain Tom Moore raised in 2020 uh, to, to uh, support a number of projects as we move forward. One of those is to provide access to coaching for wellbeing support for managers across the system, which we hope will help to equip them to support the wellbeing of their teams. And I guess as part of that, to, to practice self-care and support their own well-being as well. And the final bit I just wanted to touch on was, was I guess, the challenge of accessing support, which is something that I think through our We Care programme, which has been the kind of main banner under which we've provided um, the support for staff health and well-being over the last, uh, last couple of years, and particularly since April 2021, where the, the programme was formally launched. Um, we've, we've understood through in, interacting and engaging with staff that for those working in frontline services, sometimes it's not the, the supports available have not been so visible or easy to access because of some of the, you know, the demands on their time and the pressures they face. So the team have really been working hard to try and engage with staff in the acute sector, to provide information sessions for staff to drop into, which several hundred staff have participated in, to, uh, to encourage colleagues who want to take a lot lead on wellbeing in their area by providing resources and support for them to do that. Uh, and also by signposting as much as possible the national sources of support as well, such as the online coaching for wellbeing, which can be accessed you know, by individuals away from the workplace and in at times that maybe better suit them. We've also alongside that um, made improvements to the occupational health service over the last couple of years, including um, speeding up the, uh, the, the, the access to the wellbeing and counselling service and using additional um, funding for psychological support provided by NHS Education for Scotland. That continues and remain, it remains in place moving forward. Uh, and, and the team have also recently introduced an enhanced manager's referral uh, portal, which hopefully ensures that they can prioritise those in most, most need uh, as we move forward. Um, we've undertaken a pilot of um, uh, developing peer support capability within the emergency department and that was based on direct feedback from colleagues in ED about you know what might work for them uh, and I guess it recognizes the key value that peer relationships play in supporting us and our well-being at work and finally I'd just like to touch on a pilot of support for recovery uh, that is being undertaken with uh, with nursing staff at the moment through Horseback UK who have been providing uh, support to uh, with success to Aberdeenshire Health and Social Care Partnership uh, in, uh, in, in the last year or so. And uh, we think this is a model that really could offer benefit to our teams as they look to move on from the pandemic or this last particularly intense phase, noting that you know there are no magic endpoints, rather we move through a phase of transition and hopefully on to delivering our plan for the future. But June is well placed to talk a bit about the Horseback UK pilot, which we're really encouraged by the engagement with. So I'm going to hand back to her just now. Thank you, Tom. So many people may have already heard of Horseback UK and the work that they do, but they use they use our intervention, group intervention based um, program to support um, people who have experienced um, distress in their life to, to be able to move forward. It's an eight-week eight online course and we have 20 people that have started in May with uh, the plan to have 60 in, in total go through the program. But for us to develop it so that we are self-sufficient in this and we're able to support our own staff with our own facilitators locally and we don't require the same level of third party support that we're, we're having just now as we get developed. So the model is um, very exciting. We have lots of interest in it and um, we, we are doing our evaluation as we move through that process. The other piece of work that we're doing that's been led and developed by um, some of our chief and lead nurses um, within the acute sector is looking at time for reflection. And they're working and developing a, a box, if you like, it's going to be an orange box, um, with resources that individual um, nurses or, or other um, healthcare professionals can access. And they can use the resources in it to take some time away um, from the clinical cold face, if you like, uh, and, and take some time for reflection and just be with themselves for a while as a process of um, in supporting their own mental well-being. So these are two strategies that we have, um, particularly for nursing, already uh, ongoing, and we will continue to build on this. We have the, the findings from this study that we've had presented today, 
We also have another study going on at the moment looking at the experiences of senior charge nurses in particular. And we've also got the findings of our Culture Matters survey, which has been looking at the culture for the nursing midwifery group. NHS Grampian has a plan to, to move this forward and look at the whole organisation. But at the moment, we're, we've got the results for the nursing and midwifery cohort. So that's around about 6,000 plus staff in the organisation. With the findings from, the, from these three pieces of um, work, the data will be pulled together and triangulated, really to fully understand that we have a fantastic picture now of what's going on within our cultures in NHS Grampian so that we can make that improvement we need to move forward and make NHS Grampian a great place to work that will attract new people and retain staff. And that's where we want to get to. So we'll continue to work through our NMAP strategy, as well as um, meeting our, our, our ambitions for Magnet to make that Magnet designation. And um, ho hoping that together we'll be able to drive what we need to take us forward. Thank you. I'd just like to extend my thanks to, to everybody um, who's joined us today um, who who's viewing from uh, either from, from work, from home, in their free time. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr Aileen Grant for, for sharing these really significant findings with us uh, and uh, Dr June Brown and, and Tom Powers for um, sharing these innovative ideas um, and, and strategy going forward to try and promote uh, safety and well-being amongst staff within NHS Grampian. Um, if there is anybody who's watching this video today who would like further support, that can be accessed via the information, uh, the, the email address that we shared earlier in these uh, this presentation um, and equally if you'd like to share any further ideas that you have for, for improvements going forward and um, to, to help promote health and well-being among staff within NHS Grampian please do so via the same email as well. Uh, from me Louise Henderson thank you very much for joining us again. Um, so just to say thank you very much uh, to all our participants that took part in the study and for those of you uh, listening today. And if you'd like to access further support or share um, any ideas you have, please get in touch through our email address nursingthroughcovid.rgu.ac.uk. Thanks.